thank all of you for coming. And before I introduce Mr. Nader, I'd like to explain a little about the way the evening might go. He will speak uh, until approximately 8 o'clock or so, and then if you have other commitments or something and need to slip out, that's okay. We'll go into a question-answer session. And I was going to say people could move down to the front, but we're almost full. There will be a question-answer session until about 8.30. And then we will adjourn to a book signing in the lobby, and that should be over around 9 o'clock. And then you'll have a chance perhaps to ask some more questions or get other books signed when you come to the Union Building Ballroom uh, for a reception at 9. Perhaps most of the students in the audience know the name Ralph Nader as a presidential candidate, representative of the Green Party. You may not know of the activism that your parents or perhaps even grandparents know, and you may not know that this career did begin in college. So in introducing him, I would like to just hit a couple of the highlights of his life and share with you several of his quotes that are among my favorites. Mr. Nader entered Princeton in 1951, and from the very first, he was not someone just to fit in, just to go along with the crowd. He said, at Princeton, the chief act of rebellion was to refuse to wear white buck shoes. <laughs> After finding dead birds on the campus lawns, Mr. Nader tried to ban the spraying of DDT on the trees, perhaps the beginning of a career. He tried to rally fellow students to protest and was appalled at their lukewarm response. He was graduated from Princeton in 1955 and went on to Harvard Law School, where he developed what he called an intense distaste for Harvard's narrow intellectualism and moral complacency. He stated, if you were worried about the issues of right and wrong, justice and injustice, you were considered soft intellectually. After having graduated from Harvard Law School, he went into a rather conventional law practice in Hartford, Connecticut, and stayed there until 1963 when he went to Washington, D.C. to begin a long career of professional citizenship. Story has it that he stayed at the YMCA in Washington, walked across the street, had a hot dog, his last. A few years later, he would expose the repulsive ingredients that go into hot dogs. He took a job as a consultant for the U.S. Department of Labor and worked for Assistant Secretary of Labor Daniel Patrick Moynihan. He was also a writer, a freelance writer, for The Nation and the Christian Science Monitor. And while in Washington, he began to work on a book that literally did make him famous. Unsafe at any speed, the designed in dangers of the American automobile, which came out in 1965. The chief target was General Motors and their sporty little Corvair automobile. A beautiful car, I thought, <laughs> but its rear suspension system was faulty and it made it possible to skid violently and turn over. Mr. Nader's book documented how Detroit had subordinated safety to style. Every person in this room owes some debt of gratitude to Mr. Nader for automobile safety. His work has also helped get new laws passed dealing with unsanitary conditions of meat packing, poultry production, the dangers of natural gas pipeline, radiant radiation emissions from television sets and x-rays, hazardous working conditions in coal mines. He's opposed water pollution, frauds practiced by nursing homes, and the use of pesticides on agricultural crops. He was invited here because, as you know, he exalts his peers as well as young people to really care about this world. 
He believes one person can make a difference. Said he, almost every significant breakthrough has come from the spark, the drive, the initiative of one person. You must believe this, he says. Mr. Nader, we welcome you to DePauw. Thank you very much, President Bottoms, for those kind, uh, insightful remarks. And ladies and gentlemen, someone once described it as a lecture as being to the mind what massage is to exercise. So this evening, especially for the students here, I want to try to uh, develop uh, some frames of reference and levels of motivation, opening some windows for opportunities, and a context to stay in touch after the lecture. There will be sign-up sheets out there. I will give you some websites at, at the appropriate moment. And <clears throat> perhaps you'll uh, look back on this evening with something uh, more than just uh, a memory of a sense of uh, commonplace, which uh, some established powers call blasphemy. You have about 15,000 days before you turn 65, a little over 2,000 weeks. And did last week go quickly? So you shouldn't waste time. And too many people spend their 20s getting over problems they should have had in their teens. And before you know it, <clears throat> the 30s and your 40s and 50s, and you look back and you say, what did I do? What mark did I make on this world? What, uh, what is my own estimate of significance as a citizen? <clears throat> and by that time, it's fairly late. That doesn't mean you weren't, you're not going to succeed in terms of your occupation, uh, your material acquisitions. It does mean that you may miss the justice train, as so many, quote, successful and powerful people have in our country, and some of the more sensitive ones feel an empty feeling when they're in their 60s and 70s, that they did miss the opportunity to lock arms with others and, and strive for justice, which Daniel Webster called the great work of human beings uh, on earth. Well, we all have one thing in common to start with. We, we, we all grow up corporate. We look at the world through the filters and lenses and advertisements and messages of the most powerful institution in our country, bar none, which is the modern uh, large corporation. This is an institution that is very unified in its motivation, which is sales, profit, maximization, good compensation packages for the executives, and which, <clears throat> when it confronts um, countervailing forces, it tries to blunt them, neutralize them, undermine them, distort them, co-opt them, or destroy them. Every major religion in the history of the world warned its people not to give the commercial instinct, the commercial mercantile interest too much power just because of that. It's not very tolerant for civic values. And that's what the rule of law is for, and that's what politics are for. And politics now have a completely different meaning. See, when you take a word that has a historic context, starting in ancient Athens, when it was considered a concept of governing uh, contrary to autocracy, something akin to Periclean democracy. And now that word is commonly used in all generational levels as a dirty word. It's, it's something that's viewed as uh, sleazy, dirty, ineffective, and it's a dismissive word. Every day you can turn on the TV news and politicians are accusing each other of playing politics. Well, that's what they're supposed to do. <laughs> but you see, that isn't the modern meaning. So the colloquial meaning of the word has been, has been turned into something completely contrary to its original meaning. Therefore, the image of it, the practice of it, the perception of entering it is distorted and debased 
as well. <clears throat> if I were to ask the students here, how many of you are contemplating going into government service, public, st local, state, federal? Can I see the hand? No. How many of you are going into the private sector, would like to go into business and all kinds of professions and, and businesses and so forth? Well, this actually is not very typical. <laughs> that probably reflects a lot of the community service that you have. Now, most people your age do not want to go into unions. They don't want to join union, the union movement. They don't want to join uh, the public service. And before the market collapsed, half of the people at Yale undergraduate want to be investment bankers, <laughs> as if we have a shortage of them. <clears throat> Now, every society has its blinders. Every society accepts certain assumptions established by the powerful institutions. You see the totems and taboos and what we call primitive tribal societies and the power of the shaman, the power of the medicine man. In the Soviet Union, it was the power of the commissars is the communist dogma. Uh, anthropologists call this the cultural focus of a society. And we need only to quote a few prominent corporate executives to conclude uh, that the, the dynamic of the way we look at our society is set by corporations. We may think we resist it, we don't. We grow up that way. As a matter of fact, two-year-olds now are the object of uh, spectacularly intrusive marketing techniques. Uh, two-year-olds, three, four, five. It's a big business. Separating children from parents having the company sell directly to the parents, undermining parental authority, knowing how often the parents are not home, knowing how lonely the kids are at home, and developing an entertainment package by the corporate parent, which is their words, the words they use in their marketing uh, seminars. So let's, let's test, test what it means to grow up corporate. I grew up corporate the way I looked at cars when I was a child. I remember going to the 1939 World's Fair with my parents and I saw this huge display, the GM Futurama. Anybody here who's at 1939 World's Fair? Anybody? Where? Any, where? Anybody? Oh, yes. You remember that? Huge. It dominated the whole landscape. And I was so excited, I ran toward it. And, ahead of my parents shouting, GM, GM, GM. <laughs> Little did GM know. <laughs> anyway. And when I got there, I remembered there were displays of future cars, cars of the future, all kinds of new engines other than the internal combustion engine, all kinds of new aerodynamics, new functions, new materials, new emission controls, New levels of fuel efficiency. 1939, we're still waiting. Still waiting. We're still saddled with this internal combustion engine. Just today, the papers report that the auto companies and the United Auto Workers are having their weight felt in Congress, and they're beating back efforts after the auto companies have been given 20-year holiday from enhancing their fuel efficiency. Uh, beating back efforts to get your fuel dollar to get more mileage. It's now 24.3 miles per gallon is the average fleet, of, fleet efficiency for new cars, trucks, and SUVs and vans. And that's the lowest in 20 years. See, this is what? This is, this is 60, 62, 63 years later. And what is the image of modern corporations? Razzle-dazzle technology, innovation, creativity, entrepreneurial images, fast-paced company, magazines known as fast company, fast forward. And what do we see around? We see America being kept down by too much corporate power and wealth and too few hands. I was very interested to see Business Week magazine in September 2000 highlight that on their front page. This is a mainstream magazine with all kinds of full page ads from TRW and General Electric and Merck Sharp and Dome and <coughs> City Group. 
And it was quite courageous. It asked too much corporate power, question mark, and in seven detailed pages inside the magazine, it answered yes, yes, yes. Then it had a poll of the American people, and 72% said corporations have too much control over their lives. And then it recommended that corporations should get out of politics in an editorial. This is an amazing demonstration of journalistic courage. And just a week ago, British Petroleum, the giant oil company based in London, announced that it was going to end all contributions by its company to political figures and parties all over the world. No more contributions. And uh, didn't get much play, but it was a very significant breakthrough. Corporations do not vote. They are not real human beings. They're artificial entities. They are not created by investors. They are funded by investors. They are created by state governments who charter them. And in some instances, federal government charters them. The birth certificate of a corporation is the charter. And years and years ago, back in the early 1800s, when the first charters were given by state legislatures, such as in Massachusetts to the early textile companies, the charters were conditioned on good behavior, they were renewable, they weren't permanent, and they were considered uh, to be a form of accountability that the corporation must exert to the public. They were very worried about this thing called the corporation uh, having all the rights of human beings and all the privileges and immunities that the concentration of power by an artificial legal entity can accumulate. They knew that a corporation was different from them as human beings. A corporation can be in a thousand places at once. You can't. A corporation create its own parent called the holding uh, company. You can't. A corporation now can have patents on life forms. It can create humanoids and may well be doing that in 20 to 30 years. A corporation can diffuse responsibility in its vast bureaucratic structure. It's hard for an individual to escape that. There are lots of differences. The New York Times just reported that corporations are pulling up roots here, opening an office in, the, in Bermuda, so they can cut their taxes to the federal government by a third. Everything stays the same, except they open up a one-room office in Bermuda. It's important to ask yourselves, and ask ourselves, what happens to our society when we grow up corporate instead of growing up civic? For instance, one thing that happens is we don't know what we own together with each other. If someone asked you to list everything you own, you start with, you know, house, car, stereo, books, clothing, furniture, food, appliances, and then you, you keep going, you keep going, you're down to paper clips. Someone says, keep going. And so I, I'm finished. There's nothing else. Yes, there is. We own with other Americans the greatest wealth in our country, and we own it legally. It's not a metaphor. We own the public airwaves. We own the public lands, onshore and offshore, one-third of our country. As workers, we own $5 trillion of pension funds, biggest capital pool in the world history. We own all the public works, the highways, the bridges, the dams, the canals. We own the massive amount of scientific research and development that our tax dollars pay for in Washington, which are given away free to corporations, sometimes under monopoly marketing agreements like Taxol, AZT and other pharmaceuticals, which your tax dollar developed, tested, human clinical testing, and then off it goes to Bristol Myers Squibb or Burroughs, uh, and they can charge whatever they want, and they do. And there's no royalties back to the government from the profits they make when they didn't spend a dime in developing the, the drug, although they take credit for it in their ads. Now, all of this commonwealth is the, the greatest wealth of our society. It's greater than the wealth of big business, greater than the wealth of rich executives. And yet we don't grow up 
even knowing what we own. Never mind talking about it, never mind asking the question, why don't we control what we own? Why do radio and TV industries control our public airwaves? Why don't they, as tenants, and we're the landlords, why don't they pay rent to the Federal Communications Commission? They've been getting our property free since the Radio Act of 1927. Billions of dollars. And in return, we have given them the power to decide who says what and who doesn't say what on radio and TV 24 hours a day. Now, whichever way you come out on this, it certainly is a subject worthy of political discussion, civic discussion, research, analysis, awareness, perception. Because what would happen if we had our own networks well-funded, partly funded by the revenue from charging these radio and TV stations rent? We might be able to communicate one another about the solutions in this country that are on the shelf and are not used because they upset certain commercial interests. We might be able to lift our own morale and our own community and express on TV and radio uh, a lot of the good efforts that citizen groups have been engaged in for years up against tough odds that never make it on the late evening television news. We might be able to highlight the creative talent in the arts, which now never get a voice in this highly standardized commercialization of our culture. We might be able to have a student channel for 15 million college, community college and graduate students so they can learn from one another and find out what's going on in various campuses around the country. Science, social service, artistic creation, engineering. The students at Caltech refined windmills over 15 years ago to make them much more efficient. You see some of their uh, research results uh, uh, driving from San Francisco to Sacramento where you see thousands of windmills producing 1,000 megawatts of power. We might be able to give ourselves a voice when we have a complaint. We might be able to get our calls returned. But if we grow up not knowing what we own, why would we ever ask the question, why don't we control what we own and look what we can do with it? Why shouldn't we have an hour a day, prime time, drive time, and our own radio and television programs? Why shouldn't we have our own audience network the way NBC and ABC and CBS? It is our property. The courts have said so. The legislature has said so. It's our property. And we don't even know we own it. We're told if you don't like what you see on TV, here's the definition of freedom. Get out. Turn the clicker. Show your power. Darken that screen. <laughs> when we don't know what we own, we don't question who controls what we own, like the minerals and the timber and the offshore oil <clears throat> policies. All of that is what we own. We don't even know about the 1872 Act, which says any foreign or domestic company can go on our land, public land, out west, discover gold, molybdenum, lead, silver, any hard metal. And if their geologists can document the discovery, they take it to the U.S. Department of Interior, and our government is required by this 130-odd-year law to sell it to that company for no more than $5 an acre. Just think of the bargain. A Canadian company discovers $9 billion worth of gold a few years ago in Nevada on federal land. That's B, billion. It got ownership to the mine by buying the requisite acreage. It cost $30,000. All the sales of the gold, all the profits accrue to the company. There is no percentage royalty. There's no third world country in the world that gives away its natural resources like this to commercial interests. Not Venezuela, not Indonesia, not Nigeria, not Saudi Arabia, no country. They cut much tougher deals with our companies than Uncle Sam cuts with our companies. Part of that is due that we grow up never realizing that it's our gold, it's our molybdenum. And so our expectation levels are suitably held down. If you can control civic expectation levels, you control people. 
You don't have to knock on doors at 4 a.m. with tough cops pushing in doors. You just control the expectation level. Your expectation level as college students, you've allowed your expectation levels to be controlled. Most students go to college university with two goals. One, to get a skill, to get a job. Not bad. Two, to socialize. Now there's something else to university or college. It's called liberal education. It's called enlightenment. It's called the subjects taught by the social sciences and the humanities, history and anthropology, economics, and sociology, literature. And yet, in campus after campus, you see this expectation level. Very few students say, I want to go to university and college because I want to learn how to be a skilled citizen. I want to learn how to practice democracy. I want to be able to leave this university with a sense of civic confidence that when I don't like something in a community, and when I think something's wrong, and when I know there are solutions to make a better life for people, that I know how to implement with my fellow citizens instead of simply throwing your hands up, looking over the political scene, getting cynical about the politicians, withdrawing, Half of the people don't even bother voting in presidential elections, leaving a vacuum, and guess who fills the vacuum? The rascals. Let's test expectation level. If you asked your friends, what do you expect from the late evening television news in your community? And I'll say, well, you know, I watch it for the sports and the weather. That's not news. Even the TV stations understand when they say, and the radio station, when they say they give you news, weather, and sports. Now, it's, it's good to know the weather and the sports. That may be another 30 minutes or so. It's not news. We know what news is. It's not weather and sports, unless it's a massive hurricane that just blows away half of Florida. And so what do you get when you watch the late evening news? 30 minutes, 9 minutes of which are ads. 4 minutes sports, 4 minutes weather, 1 minute contrived impromptu chit chat between the two anchors. <laughs> Usually leads with 3 minutes of street crime or some fire, couple stories from City Hall, the required animal interest story, <laughs> and the latest report from the New England Journal of Medicine. Maybe a movie review. And you say, well, what about all these people in the community that are putting out news releases and reports and findings and are trying to improve housing and public transit and fight tax-funded stadiums while schools and clinics crumble and they're trying to improve the quality of the schools, not, not to mention to rebuild the schools and expand the, the services of health clinics and start a local symphony or what? What about all these people? Why can't they get a half a second on their own property on the late evening news? It's not for lack of time. Just think of the time that is devoted to the weather on the late evening news. They're obsessed with the weather. There seems to be a meteorologist every day, a new one, as they cut down the number of reporters covering your neighborhoods and your communities. You, no sooner they're finished with the street crime at the top of the news, reflecting their principle of marketing, which is if it, le if it bleeds, it leads. No sooner they're finished, the weather person comes on. Going somewhere this weekend? <laughs> Stick around. I'll let you know if there's going to be a storm. <laughs> In Washington, they call the weather bureau on the TV stations the storm center. When they have a sunny day, they're sad. <laughs> so they go back and they do a little bit of the usual, and then the, the next phase of the weather comes. This time they're deadly serious. They got all the super Doppler radar. And in Washington, they invariably start with Oregon or Washington State. There's a front coming over the Cascades, weaving its way over Montana, floating over the Great Lakes. It may come to the Alleghenies, and you're saying, tell me the weather. Let me right here. What am I doing? They're not finished yet. They get into Washington, they have all the suburbs that are three miles apart, and it's 51 degrees here, and 50 degrees over there, 49 degrees here. 
And then, and they're still not finished. And 25 years ago, it was 44 degrees here and 45 degrees there. And if you look at the map, you know how they, the clouds flutter? Watch them carefully. They come in from numerous encores. They flutter like this, and they, same thing, you know? They come like this. And sometimes they say, and if you think it's, it's, it's cold here, you should see what it was today in Hibbins, Montana, or whatever, Minnesota. On and on. And as if that is enough, then they give you the five-day forecast. Now it's a seven-day forecast. Don't, no one can say there's no competition in Washington between the TV stations. Some of them are considering a 10-day forecast. But the screen isn't lot wide enough you know, for the little sun and little clouds and so forth. <laughs> and then near the end of the show, they say, we have to go to commercial break. Stay with us for a weather update. Meanwhile, what's going on in your city? Your city's not being covered by late evening news. Isn't it time for us to raise our expectation level about what should occur on what we own as a people, together, as a commonwealth? And this is part of intellectual liberation. Every culture is subjected to these kinds of constrictions. Every culture grows up through the lens of its dominant power structure. And when you think of five trillion dollars of pension funds, and they own about a third of the corporate stock on the New York Stock Exchange, and the workers do not control their investments, they're controlled by GE and IBM and the banks and the insurance companies, and of course they reflect their priorities, and sometimes their own speculative excess. So we might ask ourselves, how else do we grow up corporate and what does it matter? Well, it matters when we look at each other through standards of beauty evaluation that are inculcated in our minds many years ago and every day of our lives by the cosmetic industry and by the fashion industry. So that beauties define something skin deep and body shape instead of our own def definition of beauty, which is compassion and wit and wisdom and helpfulness. Someone often said Mother Teresa was a beautiful person. They weren't referring to beauty as Vogue magazine defines it. They're referring to what she did with her life. And yet there are millions of people, especially young people, who are in an advanced neurotic state because they think they're ugly or they don't think they're attractive and they try all kinds of things that damage their health, from diet to chemicals. And beauty is, is not supposed to hurt in any culture that's in control of itself, instead of surrendering it to the commercial interest. But commercial the definition of beauty has to hurt. That's the way it creates demand for $80 billion of beauty products and plastic surgery. Very, very painful. Billions of hours drained away, diverting human potential and life's possibilities. It's not trivial, even though the word is cosmetic. We grow up corporate when we allow standardized tests to put a number on our intelligence. The, imagine the intellectual hubris of thinking they can put a number on the intelligence of human beings. A number. How many students come to me and, over the years and I say, what do you want to be? Well, I'd like to be a biologist, but I didn't test out. What do you mean? Well, I didn't do well in three hours, one April or October morning, figuring out A, B, C, D, none of the above. There are multiple intelligences. People have different kinds of intelligences. And to try to put it all in the shoehorn is like someone saying, I'm going to test your athletic ability. Come down to the gymnasium on Saturday at 10 a.m. And you come down, and the only test is for band maintenance. They don't test you for soccer, or for baseball, or for basketball, or for volleyball, or for tennis. It's badminton. And these tests have been inflicted on now two, three generations of students when they were first started under the auspices of the Carnegie Institution, the Educational Testing Service at Princeton, New Jersey. The early framer of these tests was once asked in the 1930s, what is it that you want to achieve? 
through these tests. And at first they thought they'd be colorblind and so on, but these tests are very, very correlative with income, family income, for the obvious reasons. But he said, what is it? What is it that you're trying to, uh, trying to uh, achieve with these standardized multiple choice tests? And he said, quote, to keep hope within reasonable bounds, end quote. Just think of that. Some of the most successful doctors, lawyers, scientists didn't do well on their tests. Why? Well, who could ask? What they had were traits that weren't tested, that were successful in life. They had judgment, wisdom, creativity, idealism, stamina, diligence. And yet, millions of students are internalizing these test scores and keep their hope within reasonable bounds as a measure of their self-worth and self-esteem. We also grow up corporate when we're asked to sign on a dotted line. Is there anybody in this audience who has, when asked by an insurance policy agent or a bank teller, when you open a bank account or a hospital or an employer, when they throw these standard form contracts in front of you, auto dealer, and they say, uh, yes, you want to buy this product or service? Fine, here it is. Sign on a dotted line. And we do it. We don't realize that we're surrendering the freedom of contract. And 99% of the contracts we'll ever sign in our lives, landlord lease and all the others, are pre-printed, put before us, completely one-sided, completely to the advantage of the vendor. All responsibilities are excluded, like your shrink wrap license for your computer software, and we're supposed to sign on a dotted line. And increasingly, the corporate lawyers who are drafting these agreements are stripping us of our constitutional rights to take these companies to court before uh, a jury of our peers if we have a dispute with them, if they rip us off, if they harm us wrongfully, if they deceive us. No government can do that to you. It would be unconstitutional. No government can take away your right to go to court and have a trial by jury. But corporations do all the time. The Bank of America, the minute you open a bank account, you've given away your right to sue. You've got to go to binding arbitration, where the arbitrators want repeat business, and they're going to get it more from Bank of America than they're getting it for you. And you're at a severe disadvantage for other reasons. That's growing up corporate when we don't even object. You want to have some fun someday? If you go down to a dealer, you want to buy a used car or something? Pick out the car. Go to one of our books called What to Do with Your Lemon Car. It has a pro-consumer car purchasing agreement. Make a copy. Go down to the dealer, pick out the car. They're shuffling all the papers, checking your credit, etc., and they're ready to have you sign. You say, excuse me, excuse me. I have a contract I'd like you to sign. <laughs> Somebody actually did that and after having gotten a hold of our book, and we asked people to tell us what happened when he went down to the dealer, and he did. He came, he said he went down, he picked out the car, went to the sales person, you know, ready, pulls out this contract, which is written in clear English, big print, and says, sign it. And the sales clerk was completely dumbfounded. He grabs it and rushes to the manager of the auto dealer behind the glass cage, you know? <laughs> and they were seen going like this, like this, like this. And you know what the dealer manager did? He called the cops. <laughs> I mean, suppose you're buying auto insurance and you sit down and the agent gets you ready to sign. He says, just a minute, my mommy and daddy told me never to sign anything I didn't read. Can I sit down and read it? I've got my magnifying glass. Sure. You sit down, you read it, and it's things you don't like. Cross out a paragraph here. <laughs> Add a few remarks there. Double the warranty if it's a car dealer, you know. You got it just right. You take it back and you say, I think we got a deal. Sign on the dotted line. Huh? These people 
call you a communist, chase you out of their office. Now, do you realize how imbalanced the bargaining power becomes year after year? Have you ever tried to get a hold of your bank? Have you ever tried to get a hold of an airline? This is a nation put on hold. Press one, press two, press three. You press three, they hit you with another layer. Press one, press two. You press two, they hit you with another layer. I saw four layers the other day. I hit my fourth layer. And then they say, our representatives are handling other customers. Please be patient. Your business is important to us. And then they hit you with music and ads. Can you imagine the time? They don't respect our time. And we can't do anything about it. Because if we call the competitor, it's the same thing. With one or two exceptions. FedEx answers in two rings with a real human being. And so does Southwest Airlines. Why don't all the rest do it? They get away with it. Years ago when I was working late at night, I'd want to listen to classical music, I dialed United Airlines. <laughs> Street crime last year is declining, fortunately, still too high. 15,500 homicides in homes and streets. Try this, OSHA, 58,000 workers die from toxics and trauma every year. EPA, 65,000 people die from air pollution connected diseases. Harvard School of Public Health, 80,000 people die in hospitals, not emergency rooms, just hospitals every year from the grossest medical incompetence and negligence. Just for starters, it can go on. Think how many people died because simple safety devices were not put in your cars people who are your own relatives, maybe your parents, your uncles, your aunts, your children. Until some of these systems were put in cars, they were known decades ago. Padded dash panels came in in the mid, you know, early 60s. You know when padded dash panels were first invented and used? By the manufacturers of the ancient Roman chariots. 2,000 years lead time, not enough for GM. Seat belts were used by our pilots in, Air Fo in, in uh, World War I, so they didn't fall out of the little biplanes. They weren't put as standard equipment until the mid-60s in cars. Airbags were developed and tested by Ford and GM privately in their proving grounds in the 50s. They weren't put in as standard equipment until the late 80s and early 90s. Stronger door latches? Boy, that takes a brilliant engineering breakthrough. <laughs> VW had such weak door latches that you drive up to your house or you drive up to a hotel, you wouldn't need valet service. All you do is you hit the curb and the doors fly open. <laughs> like that. They had horn ornaments and, f and fins that killed pedestrians at very, very low impacts, three, four miles an hour. You know, the Greek physician, ancient Greek physician, Hippocrates, laid it on the line. He said, a human being is more likely to collide against a flat yielding surface safely than a sharp cutting edge. Again, 2,000 years plus lead time to General Motors. And we had to work like the Dickens to get them to even admit that they killed people. And they still have, have them, although the fins are now fortunately gone. But they still have some hood ornaments. And then, because we couldn't get the hood ornaments out, you should see the brain damaged infants, little kids playing tricycles right into death. Documented pathology. And we finally got them to, to agree that they would put the hood ornament in, on a spring. So watch it now. When you collide with the front of a car, right, do not go up and down on the hood ornament. Go this way and it'll bend. When I was a law student, I did a paper on unsafe automobiles. And I wrote to all the auto companies and asked them a number of questions. And one of them was, uh, all your cars have these lurid fins. You remember some of the pictures of them. Some of you owned these cars. The 1959 Cadillac had a three-pronged uh, tail uh, structure that looked like the tail of the dinosaur Pregasaurus. Deadly. 
actually impaled a nine-year-old girl on her tricycle in Kensington, Maryland, fatally, right in front of her parents. She bumped into the bumper, went right in uh, to the fin structure. And I, so I wanted to find out what the purpose of fins were. I don't know, this is engineering companies, right? So I'd write to GM, Ford, Chrysler, and the answer would come back, dear law student, thank you very much for your interest, and the answer to your question is that these fins uh, serve an important aerodynamic function. Oh, well, this is really interesting. And uh, 1960 came, 62, 63, all the fins became shorter and less prominent until they disappeared. So I concluded the winds had changed. You know the, the, the rear view mirror in front of you? Uh, that used to kill a few hundred people every year. You'd be in the front right, front right seat and you'd have a left front collision and in the front right seat, your head would go right into the rear view mirror. It would not give, your skull would be shattered. So for seven years, we, we, it took us to get the auto executives to free their own engineers who knew how to do this for decades and put a breakaway rear view mirror in front of you. So if your head hits it, the rear view mirror gives rather than your head. It's a rather humane trade-off. <laughs> this is what happens. And if we don't grow up civic and think for ourselves, if we allow 50 years of advertising to sink into our consciousness, so we say, oh, that's not possible, oh, that's not possible, or, gee, I, that, that's, that's good to consume, even may be bad for you. Well, we don't have a good quality of life. For 50 years, we've been seeing these auto ads on television. Do you ever see an auto ad on television in stuck in congested traffic? Do you ever see a new ad for automobiles? You know, and they're going bumper to bumper. No, they're on roads, mountain roads, and all kinds of... It's like there isn't another car on the highway. So you get a sense of freedom and mobility. Instead of getting stuck in traffic 15 hours a week, people say we have a, a longer life expectancy in our country. Not if you subtract the years we spend stuck in traffic, we don't. <laughs> now, have you ever seen an ad for modern mass transit? Where people are going to work, sitting, relaxing, reading the paper, snoozing, chatting with their fellow passengers, and moving way ahead of a parallel highway, bumper to bumper, trucks, vans, and cars, with people exhibiting road rage and imbibing pollution and wasting time and getting fatigued. You never see that. And so year after year, you know, we buy into, oh, public transit, snorting buses, and they're not very good, and this and that. Uh, we got to go into the vehicle. We have no idea what modern mo public transit is these days. How flexible it is, how adaptable it is, how little land uh, space it takes up, how minimally polluting it is, how enhancing it is not to have to get to work so exhausted. And yet our whole residential business patterns now have adjusted to the car. How do you get to a mall? through public transit. But year after year, it gets into it. Someone says, well, some corporate think tank in Washington puts out a report and says, public transit is not economical. Why don't you see that most of the day, 80% of these vehicles, transit vehicles, buses, subways, are empty? And no one says, yeah, I've seen that. But I also look at crowded highways and four out of five seats in every car is empty. But that's okay. It's if we're not paying for it. You think you're paying a buck thirty a gasoline per gallon of gasoline or buck twenty-five? We're paying fifty billion dollars just to safeguard mid Mideast oil. Crank that into your sales. And all the other subsidies to the auto industry and the highway industry. So we get it direct and indirect. If we just reverberate off the propaganda messages, we don't ask these kinds of questions. And we don't liberate the creative, technical, engineering, scientific, medical talents of our people. Now, what does it mean to grow up civic? Well, first of all, how much time do we spend on our civic duties? We have a very, very busy life. More and more members of the family have to work longer and commute longer 
to eke out a middle class standard of living. And they, then they have to go into debt because it's not enough. The standard, middle class standard of living when I was growing up in Connecticut was defined as being reachable by a textile worker. Could buy a six room house, two and a half percent, 30 year mortgage, and a second hand car of not ancient vintage. Today you can have three textile workers in that family and they couldn't do it. Seven, seven, eight percent, 30 year mortgage. The cost of a house, paying mortgage in a house today is about 30% of family income. It was about 15% in the 50s. Don't want to glamorize the 50s, the early 50s and the late 40s. But if we take the definition of a middle class standard of living today, you can't do it with one breadwinner for most families. Especially since 47 million full time workers in this country don't make a living wage. That's one out of every three workers. They're making five and a half, six, seven, eight, nine, ten bucks an hour before deducting the costs of going to work. Another car, another insurance policy, another repair bill, another daycare bill. The average daycare now costs $500 a month in this country. So if we don't spend time on our civic duties, the corporations will plan our lives for us very, very readily, as they do. It's called strategic planning. Through their campaign contributions and their maneuvers over our elected officials, they plan our political future. Through their scientific patents and other maneuvers, they're planning our genetic future, planning to own the genetic inheritance of the world, including human genes. Through their credit industry, they're planning our privacy future and all the dossiers that are bit up, bit built up on what we do and what we buy and what we don't buy and what we listen to and where we buy and our medical and our financial data and our genetic data. Through their own corporate foreign policies and their desire to have huge weapon systems built that were geared for the Soviet Union era of hostilities, they're shaping a lot of our foreign and, def and defense policies. The corporations, through their corporatizing, commercializing education, especially higher education, and they have enormously growing influence over major universities in our country, the kind of research, the kind of moonlighting, the consultantships, the shaping of the curriculum. They're planning our educational future by the power over the workplace with the declining influence of trade unions. They're planning our work future. And it keeps going. Now, when are we going to plan our own future? That's what democracy is supposed to allow us to do. That we develop a deliberative democracy. We scope out our problems, our necessities, our needs, our injustices. We see what we can do to remedy these. And we build a better life here and abroad. They're planning our energy future, these corporations. You know what it is? It's oil, coal, gas, and nuclear. Because it's highly capitalized forms of energy that we can't get at. It's not solar. Solar is owned by all of us. But it isn't subsidized the way fossil fuel and nuclear have been. It doesn't have a voice in Washington, so it's skipping along here and there. You can see some solar homes and solar buildings and photovoltaics and wind power, a little biomass, but it doesn't amount to a very great percentage of our energy, unless you crank in hydropower. So where are we left? We're left with either giving title to the sun to Exxon, then we'll get solar energy really quickly. Or allowing this magnificent four billion duration source of energy that does not create acid rain, generate global warming, it doesn't scar whole landscapes the way strip mining does, it doesn't pump all the acids from the runoffs into our streams and rivers and bays, and it's still not here. 
And why it isn't here is because the corporate power is for fossil fuel and nuclear, and we don't have the civic power even to get a level playing field for solar. And in 1952, President Truman's Materials Policy Advisory Commission, composed of business and labor leaders, recommended that our country go solar. And that by 1975, three quarters of all homes in America would be solarized. Instead, our country went nuclear in 1954 under the Adams for Peace program, a historic wrong turn in the fork in the road. As Yogi Berra once said, when you reach a fork in the road, take it. Well, we took the wrong one. In 1950, President Truman offered universal health care to Congress. The AMA, American Medical Association, was too powerful in Congress. He was defeated. 52 years later, we don't have it. When we don't have civic power, when we don't have a certain number of years in an average lifetime, when there are really creative civic breakthroughs, the way they had in Western Europe after World War II, out of the rubble of World War II, these countries gave all their people, all their people, universal health care, full paid maternity leave, full paid family sick leave, four weeks paid vacation, decent public transit, far better benefits than we have, and a far greater ability to form trade unions to collectively bargain their standard of living with these corporations. I don't think they could have gotten that through today, but they had a certain window of opportunity, and we never had that window of opportunity because our civil society was not strong enough because not enough people spent time out of their daily or weekly or, or monthly routines in civic advocacy, which is different than civic, civil, civic service. Service, of which the students do a lot here at DePaul, is quite different than civic advocacy. Service is the administration of charity, helps people in need, helps children in need. It doesn't go to the causes. Justice goes to the causes. You have to have both. We should all ask ourselves, are we shortchanging ourselves in terms of our civic contributions? If we don't learn how to practice democracy and we don't have civic skills, we will think that we can't fight City Hall or Exxon, or is it now Enron. We will say that they, quote, will do whatever they want and they'll decide whatever they want. And yet in our history, there were junctures when ordinary people did extraordinary things. The abolition of slavery, the women's right to vote, the worker trade union movement, the farmer populist progressive movement, the civil rights movement, women's rights movement. People with disabilities now having access to schools and job opportunities when 40, 50 years ago they were out of sight, out of mind. How did all this and, and more happen? The consumer, environment movement. Because a few ordinary people did extraordinary things, represented value systems perceived as acceptable by larger numbers of people who gave them passive support. And it filtered into the legislatures or filtered in to the councils of decision making. It's our generation's turn to put our arm to that wheel of justice. And it's very important for colleges to have civic skill training courses in their curriculum so you can learn how to be skilled consumers, skilled citizens, skilled taxpayers demanding value in government services for taxes paid. These are very, very important intellectual challenges. Don't let anybody tell you that these are not proper subjects for colleges and universities. Not colleges and universities who spend so much of their resources teaching people how to use a machine called a computer. We used to, we used to call that typing in the old days. I know I, I went to a law school where, as uh, President Bottoms pointed out in his introduction, where if you talked about issues of justice instead of technical rigorous analysis of 
securities law and property law and landlord-tenant law. We had a course on landlord-tenant at Harvard. We never got to the tenant. <laughs> like we're going to graduate representing landlords. You don't make any money representing tenants. And anything dealing with ought or should uh, was just considered, they, they would dismiss it with the phrase public policy. That's public policy. At Harvard, they made you sharp by making you narrow. In fact, one famous judge who writes a book every 10 months, Judge Posner, uh, out of Chicago, he teaches a, a course at the University of Chicago Law School. And one day he came into his course about 12 years ago, I went in this account, student. He walks in, first day of class. That's when the professors were the ultimate tyrants over law students, like that movie 1L. And he walked in, he turns around, and he writes on the blackboard the word justice. Turns to his students. He said, see that word? He said, I don't want to ever hear that word again in my course. It was all law and economics, marginal utilities, cost benefit. Everything had a dollar sign to it. Everything had an opportunity cost to it. Einstein who presumably would be considered by Mr. Posner as even smarter than him, <laughs> once said, physics is simple compared to politics. These are the truly challenging intellectual endeavors. How do you make a bureaucracy accountable? How do you develop a tax system that produces revenue and good public policy at the same time? Like taxing things we don't like, pollution, speculation. How do you build new civic institutions for new technologies that are out of control? Artificial intelligence, genetic engineering. We have the ACLU and NAACP and Civil Liberties and Civil Rights, almost 90 years old or so. You wouldn't recognize your Civil Liberties and Civil Rights without the Supreme Court cases brought by these two citizen organizations. We need more citizen organizations. Jean Monnet, one of the founders of the European Common Market, once said, without people, nothing is possible, but without institutions, nothing is lasting. There was a period here in Indiana and Ohio before the Civil War when colleges were cropping up like tulips in the spring. That was the way people contributed, who had means. They'd start a college or they'd start a library. They built institutions that endured long after their passing. There are a lot of creative solutions in this country that we don't apply and a lot of problems we don't deserve. It strikes me that when I hear these government economists like uh, Alan Greenspan, chairman of the Federal Reserve, go up to Congress and, and these business economists say during the 90s, our economy is in great shape. They go on TV and say it can't get any better. And I'm saying, oh, what yardsticks are they using? Whoever controls the yardsticks controls the agenda and the perception of the agenda. So they were using yardsticks of gross national product increasing quarter by quarter, corporate profits increasing quarter by quarter, interest rates stable, unemployment down to five or so percent. They weren't using very distributional criteria. They weren't saying, well, this economy is booming, but there's 20% child poverty, 25% in, in California, that we have the highest rate of child poverty in the Western world, the lowest rate of trade union membership in the private sector just dropped under 10%. If you don't think trade unions with all their problems, and we fought a lot of corruption in trade unions over the years, but if you don't think they help build the middle class in this country and help millions of workers who never were in trade unions, you're not reading economic history properly. <laughs> We've had uh, homelessness increase. We've had malnutrition, lack of affordable housing. We've had lots of indicators that are never subsumed under this, oh, this is really a booming economy. Well, it did boom for the top 10%, and it really boomed for the top 5%, and it went into orbit for the top 
of the richest people in the country who have financial wealth equal to the combined financial wealth of the bottom 95% of all Americans. But the disparity of wealth is staggering. Just recently documented by an economist at NYU, his name is Professor Eric Wolf, Edward Wolf. And that book is available uh, by the New Press, if any of you are interested in it. So what it really comes down to is what's be between our own ears and <clears throat> what we want to do to contribute to our society through the civic values to counteract and restrain the unbridled corporate commercial values that are moving into every nook and cranny of our society, including the commercialization of childhood, which is troubling more than a few parents. I want to end by asking a question that makes a telling point. If someone asked you, who are you, you'd say your name. And they'd say, well, who else are you? And you'd say, well, uh, I'm a teacher. I'm an engineer. I'm a nurse. Well, who else are you? Well, I'm a Hoosier. I'm an American. Uh, well, who else are you? Well, I'm a parent. I'm a father. I'm a mother. I'm an aunt, uncle, grandparent, child. Who else are you? He said, well, I am, I'm, a, I'm a stamp collector. I'm a cat lover. I'm a musician. Well, who else are you? Well, I'm an Indiana U fan. Or I'm a DePaul women's basketball fan. <laughs> and who else are you? Well, at what point, at what point, you say, well, I'm an Italian American, I'm an Irish American, I'm a Chinese American. Well, well, who else are you? You keep going, at what point do you answer, I'm a citizen? That's the most important role we'll ever play, apart from parenting. Because that's the role that determines the level of justice. That's the role that determines the quality of a democracy. That's the role that determines how we answer our grandchildren when they sit on our knee at the inquisitive age of 10, having looked around the internet about the state of the tormented world and ask, why didn't you do something about it? And what are we gonna say? What are we going to say? Have direct eye contact. That searching, yearning, idealistic child on your knee. You're going to say that you didn't have time? You were otherwise preoccupied? You were stuck in traffic? You are trying to figure out indecipherable bills on weekends? You're going to say that you want to watch the reruns of Cheers? What are we going to say? You want to get motivation for civic action? You want others to get motivated? Ask them what they're going to say to their grandchildren in a world where three billion people are hanging by their fingernails, living on one or two dollars a day equivalent, racked with pain, worms in their gut, malaria, tuberculosis, AIDS, no shelter, land erosion everywhere, undermining their ability to grow their food, and in so many ways, in gross pain, and unable to speak out with dictatorships and authoritarian oligarchies all over the place. Now, some people hear the bad news, they get discouraged and demoralized. People say to me, how do you keep going? And I say, well, I really not... Don't think about that. I'm not into mood changes. <laughs> How do you keep going? Do you ask an athlete that? Do you ask a musician that? Do you ask an entrepreneur that? Why is it that these people are supposed to be resilient and bounce back and be determined and, and be all consumed with what they're doing? But somehow we don't have standards like that. We give citizens a pass. We allow them to give up. 
We allow them to engage in the self-indulgence of quitting, of telling the concentrated powers that they don't have to defeat them, they've defeated themselves. I'm going to leave uh, in the library in about a week a book we did called Civics for Democracy, A Journey for Teachers and Students. Those of you are interested in getting together with your faculty <clears throat> to have a course on citizen skills. Someone asked you, uh, can you write a thousand word essay on your citizen skills? If they asked me when I was at school, I would say, what are you talking about? I don't know what you're talking about. Someone asked you to do that for athletic skills, social skills, academic skills, you'd be able to write it. If you don't know how to use the Freedom Information Act, you don't know how to do a voter profile, you don't know how to run a news conference, you don't know how to build a coalition, you don't know how to do a lot of things because we don't learn it in school. We don't connect the classroom with the community enough. We do in the service area a lot, but we don't do it in going to the structural roots of problems, not just trying to ameliorate symptoms, important as that is for people in pain and need. I'm also going to leave something called How to Improve Your Daily Newspaper, a manual for readers. You need that here? Okay. Our websites, for those of you who want internship opportunities, essential.org, look for the book called Good Works, A Guide to Social Change Careers. It profiles a thousand groups all over the country, environmental, consumer, labor, neighborhood, housing, and so on. Lots of students go there, these groups. If you want to learn more about the rallies that uh, we're engaging in around the country, bringing a lot of local uh, groups to the big arenas so they can connect with one another and get more supporters and members. It's called democracyrising.org, democracyrising.org. If you're interested in uh, things like the uh, Enron scandal and how we can get uh, structural reform against corporate crime, fraud, and abuse, it's citizenworks. Dot org, citizenworks.org. And if you're interested in <clears throat> health care issues, drugs, price of medicines, safety of medicines, congressional issues, and global, corporate globalization issues, the website is citizen.org. In the 60s and 70s, we got a lot done in Washington. There were certain key members of Congress who really believed in government of, by, and for the people. They were chair of important committees. We got the environmental laws through and the safety and workplace laws through and uh, auto safety, on and on. We can't do that today. The two parties are becoming more look-alike. They're becoming more reflective of the same moneyed interests that Thomas Jefferson warned us about in supporting their campaigns. And almost every door in Washington has a dollar sign on it, and you can't get in if you don't have dollars. And who has the dollars? Overwhelmingly the business community, which commun contributes 80% of money in federal elections. Public elections should be funded publicly. Should not be put up for auction. Yeah. Money in, in campaigns nullifies your vote. Your vote should not be nullified. Politics should be a subject of competition by different viewpoints on the merits, not on the money. And yet, Congress, which has the plenary power to do what you, some of you just applauded, they have the plenary power to end what they all will admit is a groveling, distasteful process of endlessly phoning and going to fundraisers from special interest groups who want a quid pro quo, they can have a well-promoted voluntary check off on the 1040 tax return, up to $100 per person. You don't want to give, you don't have to give anything. You give, any ballot qualified candidate taps in, cannot take private money, and gets a certain amount of free television radio time on our public airwaves as a condition of the license granted to the broadcasters. They have the power to do that, yet they still prefer to one-up their potential competitors 
by groveling for far more money in order to daunt or intimidate any competition that might displace their political careers. I was called up by a senator from South Carolina, Senator Hollins, about five weeks ago. He'd always been against public funding of public campaigns. He'd just come back from a fundraiser in South Carolina where he's raising funds for other senators, not just himself. And he said in his inimitable southern accent, he, sa he says, Ralph, he says, for, for 40 years I've been in favor of private funding of campaigns and I'm going to change my mind. He said, do you know, Ralph, that one-third of all time by the U.S. senators in this body is committed to raising money? It took him 40 years, but he did it. <laughs> These are the kinds of changes which only we can make. And it's up to us to decide how we're going to change our routines. As far as the students here are concerned, do you do roughly the same thing every weekend? Are you already in a routine? You've got to break the routine. You've got to be a leader. You've got to, in effect, define leadership as producing more leaders, not more followers. You've got to have the kind of life that not only takes care of your family and your standard of living, your children, but takes care of your fellow human beings and your society and your world and what our founding fathers called posterity. And there's no better time to start than when you have full play of your reflective abilities without paying a penalty, when you can ask the tough questions, when you can experiment, when you can think, when you can create, so that by the time you graduate, you won't have to ask yourself, I wonder what I'm going to do with my life. There's so much that you can do for this world because you're in the top 1 or 2% of all people your age in the world in terms of your health, your education, your ability to make a difference because of the country you live in and its power. And that means a moral imperative for you to do it, for you to have a higher estimate of your own significance. Thank you. sort of reorganize ourselves and uh, Mr. Nader and I were just chatting about the rest of the schedule for the evening and uh, he's had a long day and I had offered for, to move the question answer session uh, to the reception but he said he's not in any hurry so uh, I know some of you have different commitments so let's say for three or four questions or so maybe for about 15 minutes we'll have questions and answers here and then we will have uh, the opportunity for the book signing in the lobby and then we'll move over to the union building. So uh, there'll probably be longer lines and we'll have the opportunity to get to everybody but we might just start. If you want to start right over here just ask your question and we'll, we'll try to keep things as simple as we can so as many people can speak as have the opportunity. Yes, you want to start? Uh, thank Mr. you. Mr. Nader, thank you, for your, <laughs> thank you for your talk tonight. I definitely think of myself as one of those people that has been raised corporate and that I don't necessarily have the skills to live civically. Uh, but I was touched by your talk about living wage tonight and how many people don't have enough money uh, to support their families and also inspired by your uh, call for us to ask those tough questions. So I was wondering if you had any advice or pointers on how myself and my fellow students can convince Dr. Bottoms and the administration and the board of trustees here at DePaul that the people who work for us at DePaul, our support staff, need to make a living wage. And what can we do to help that fight and to work? Well, 
Well, not having any factual knowledge about what the situation here, I can only answer that generally, that places uh, on the East Coast where they found that uh, universities subcontract to companies who then have virtually no benefits and they pay their workers six fifty an hour, uh, the students really made a big contribution. They, at Harvard, uh, Johns Hopkins, others, and sensitized the administration to the need to uh, fill that gap. Harvard has an endowment of $20 billion and it was paying uh, hundreds and hundreds of its workers under $9 or $8 an hour. And now they're going to raise it. they raise all their workers to, I think, ten fifty plus uh, broader benefits. Uh, I think what you can do is, I mean, let's face it, students can be a pain in the neck to administrators. And, 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 uh, and a lot of these administrators, when they were students, they were a pain in the neck to administrators. So you fill a historic function <laughs> in that way. And what you should do is, is sit down and, in effect, write an argument on your behalf with all the facts and figures. And if you don't have all the facts and figures, ask the administration for them. Uh, and then present it as an intellectual endeavor and ask for a response in writing. A lot of times, you don't have that kind of exchange so that the arguments pro and con don't get winnowed out uh, and uh, don't have a chance to contend and prevail over one another. Put it in writing, and then they'll be much more serious in terms of the, of the response. Yes. Yes, uh, you were speaking earlier about corporate influence over universities. My question is sort of asking what your reflections are as the university, as a corporation, especially in its relation to the higher cost of education nowadays. Well, that's a, that is a question that people are grappling with now. For example, how much of the tuition increase at these large research universities is a reflection of having to support increasing laboratories and other facilities in the bidding for biotech joint ventures and computer joint ventures and defense research and so on. And the, the budgets are extremely difficult to understand if you can even get them broken down. Uh, so that's what's happened. There's a professor, uh, David Noble, he's teaching at MIT, he now teaches at York University in Toronto, uh, Canada, who will give you a lot of leads in that respect. Uh, I just uh, was talking with a professor in uh, in uh, Washington State, and she told me how very often the, the research contracts that universities uh, sign with these corporations uh, commercialize all the product completely, uh, or they have joint uh, patent holdings. Uh, 